All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the monthly meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society. And I've got just a couple of announcements to make. Uh, the first one uh, was very sad news. Uh, Robin and Frank Cassidy's 22-year-old grandson was killed in an automobile accident yesterday morning. And for those of you who are here, we have a card that people could sign. Um, there's going to be no meeting in January, but we have one in February, and Dave will be sending out information in a timely manner about that. Uh, the voting for trustees is ongoing and will continue until the end of the month. So if you haven't voted, please do so. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, not 9.30 as was originally announced, uh, we're going to be decorating the upside down house for Christmas. So if you, if you want to come and help, please do. And if you have any decorations, uh, we can see if we can fit them in, but they have to be upside down. Um, any other announcements? Okay, well, after, for those of us who are in the room, after the meeting, uh, we, you could eat dinner downstairs. And now I get to introduce tonight's speaker, Linda LaPierre, who I think everybody knows. And she's going to be talking about uh, life in Lundy Canyon. And I asked her what I should say. And she told me something that I knew, but you may not all know, that she really loves Lundy Canyon and everything about it. So here's, oh, and if you've never been on it and she's doing it next summer, you should go on one of her Lundy hikes. They're great. Here's Linda. Thank you, Cole. Is that close enough? Okay. We're going to start with this first first photo of Lundy uh, Lake, and this is to show that Lundy is a natural lake. And um, the dam was built in 1911, but the lake you can see is fairly high. So um, it was built in 1911 to generate power at the Jordan Power Plant. So as you can see, there are, this is 1880s early. They're already starting to build um, on the shore of the lake. O.J. Lundy and his wife and four daughters settled in Mill Creek Canyon in 1879. O.J., in partnership with Jonathan Boomershine, developed a sawmill on Mill Creek with lumber going to Bodie and to Aurora. The Lundys had acquired their land by preemption, meaning basically that they were squatters. In 1880, O.J.'s brother, James, was living with his family on the timber patent of his son, W.O. Lundy. W.O. was married to his cousin, Ella, O.J.'s daughter. They had an infant son, Albert, the first white child that was born in Lundy. The O.J. family also offered meals and beds to early prospectors in the canyon and later built the Lundy Hotel um, in Lower, Lower Lundy Main Street. It was, they had filled the um, walls with sawdust from the sawmill and it caught on fire and burned very, very quickly because of the sawdust. The foundation is still there. Gold was discovered in Lake Canyon in 1879 with the largest mine, the May Lundy, named for O.J.'s young daughter, May. Boomershine was also listed as one of the locators of the May Lundy. Next. By June of 1880, Lundy was a bustling mining camp with saloons, boarding houses, mercantile stores, a camp newspaper, 
with more people arising, arriving every day. The June 1880 census reported 200 people in the camp with various occupations listed. Butchers, bakers, carpenters, blacksmiths, stonemasons, hotel keepers, merchants, liquor dealers, and saloon keepers, and gambling. All the things that are needed to start a mining camp. The majority were miners and labor, laborers, mostly single men over 30, and most could read and write. Many were foreign, but had been naturalized. All wanted to participate in local government. There were also three US government surveyors, Howard Carpenter, John Gilchrist, William Haverly. John Gilchrist, the Mount Gilchrist was named for him in Lundy Canyon. They were kept busy surveying mining claims and Mono Basin land. In later times, uh, Carpenter was the surveyor and uh, worked on the Great Sierra Wagon Road. Three men with their families arrived in 1880s and were active in community and county affairs in Lundy for most of its history. Rodney Montrose came from Canada by way of Genoa, Nevada, with his wife and five daughters. Three sons were born in Lundy. For several years, he had a steam-powered sawmill on the shore of Lundy Lake and later built the Hotel Monte on Lower Main Street. He built a housing track on Chicago Avenue where he lived. He was a Mono County supervisor and active in the Republican Party. He died in 1910 at the County Poor Farm, which had a hospital. Several of his daughters married Lundy bachelors and his youngest daughter taught at Mono School in later years. Richard Pierce came to Lundy from Candelaria, Nevada, and was employed at the May Lundy Mine in 18, at the May Lundy Mine. In 1891, he was the superintendent of the Jackson and Lakeview Mine. He lived with his wife and two children in the Chicago tract, along with Louis DeChambeau. He was a delegate to the Democratic Convention in Bodie in 1890, and was a Lundy postmaster 1888 to 1891. He remained involved in the May Lundy in partnership with Tom Hanna when Hanna purchased the May Lundy for back taxes in 1921, the Crystal Lake Mining Company. Alonzo Llewellyn Butterfield arrived in Lundy in 1880 from Maine. He was, and his brother were very much involved in the May Lundy Company. He worked as a millman up at the, up at the uh, mill site. Became a prominent merchant by 1888, was school trustee, and appointed a Lundy's postmaster in 1891. And he was a postmaster until the, uh, demise of Lundy. He purchased several Lundy properties in 1888. Uh, I don't know what Owned a general merchandise store, the Pioneer Cash Store, which was also a post office store, until his death of stomach cancer at Lundy in 1914. It's very unusual for them to even mention that his death was caused from cancer because cancer was almost a forbidden word. He also owned the patented property of the Mono Lake Hydraulic Mining Company located on Mill Creek, even down into just below uh, Mono City. His wife and four and a half year old daughter, Grace, arrived in Lundy in 1882. Their home was a large house on the north side of Upper Main Street. 
Albert Taylor came to Lundy in the 1890s. He owned a butcher shop and a livery stable and bought the Montrose Hotel in 1900, changing the name to the Taylor House. He married a widow with two children. He died in Bridgeport in 1931. His stepdaughter, Sadie King, eloped with John DeChambeau, Louis DeChambeau's brother, and that was quite a scandal for the time, an elopement. These men were all prominent citizens held in high esteem by Mono County citizens and were a stabilizing influence in the mining camp. There were at, they were active in politics, held public office, and owned most of the, much of the property in Lundy. Their children attended Lundy School. They had their family, they and their families participated in Lundy social activities, dances, parties, and holiday celebrations. They recognized and promoted the recreational value of Lundy Lake for fishing and boating and ice skating in winter. After Lundy's demise, some of members of these families stayed in the area working in Bodhi, teaching school, and working for the power companies. While Lundy became more peaceful in later years, in the early 1880s, Lundy had a reputation as a rough mining camp. There were numerous gunfights, shooting deaths, robberies, drunkenness in the streets, and an in incident of indecent exposure near the schoolhouse. All these were reported in the local newspaper. Stealing firewood was considered a heinous offense as the town was dependent on firewood. As all the mining camps with a large population of single men, Lundy had gambling in the saloons with feral all the rage. Houses of prostitution and payday brought town to life with the addition of a hurdy-gurdy house and a reported opium den. To keep the peace, Lundy had a constable, Anton Mistretti, mainly a night watchman, and occasionally a deputy chef, sheriff. John Murray was a deputy sheriff, tax collector in Lundy, with his office in the elegant saloon which he owned. A jail was built when there were complaints of prisoners being chained to trees. The jail was solidly built of logs and was later sold to Mono County as most prisoners were transferred to the Bridgeport Jail. Justice of the Peace Medlicott presided over, courts, over court proceedings in the beginning in the Snowflake Saloon until a courtroom was built near the post office door. Next. Eighteen. This is the first early town. It was 1880, probably June, summer of 1880. This is the town site map of Lundy. It, it's dated 1888, and it was used for some questionable property ownership because some early properties were acquired by preemption, meaning squatting. Title to these properties was resolved in Jonathan Boomershine's favor, and he was granted a U.S. town site patent in 1895. This map has been helpful in showing where the businesses in Lundy were located, different buildings and businesses. I Show, are shown on the map. The newspaper reference Chinese living near Clark Street. This map shows China houses on Main Street in Block J and business in businesses 
in Block T on the north side of Lundy Lake. Blocks A, B, and L, K were the main business district. Property has remained a town site in Lundy Canyon since the beginning. The resort is individual, still individual town parcels, which is very interesting. It is not zoned as a commercial property. Next. The newspaper in Lundy, the Homer Mining Index, was founded by Bodie Printers, John Curry, and J. E. Baker. The first issue appeared in Lundy June 12, 1880. It was a 20-column weekly published every Saturday, $8 per year, 25 cents a week. That was the price throughout the whole history of the Homer Mining Index. Page one, usually listed professional business cards of the many attorneys, physicians, land agents, local officials, and newsworthy items received by telegraphic communication. Page two, occasional editorial, often of a political nature, especially during election year, and other out of the area news. Page three, Local columns, various titles, camp and country, index inklings, lot, jots and splinters, included notice of marriages, births, death, gossip, parties, and balls. The weekly mining review reported the progress of the mines. Next. Oh. That's not right. Go back. Sorry. Page four. Legal notices, including patent application to land office, notices of proof of labor or mining claims. The income from legal notices and advertisements, which were interspersed throughout the paper, kept it going as many subscribers were delinquent. And there were always notices to those delinquent subscribers to pay their bills. In January, 1881, Baker and Curry had left to pursue mining interests. And the index was published for a few months by Lying Jim Townsend. This is his photo. More about Townsend in a few moments. In August, John Ginn, a journalist from Georgia with experience with several Nevada newspapers, was the publisher. He left after one year to take a position with the California and Yosemite Short Line, a proposed railroad from Sacramento to Denver across Yosemite and down Levining Canyon. Later, when the road, after the Sierra Wagon Road was built, it was determined that Levining was a much better route, even though Lundy had been considered, the Lund, going down Lundy Canyon, because Levining Canyon had already been surveyed for the railroad. So they decided that they would keep it, that was the road that they would, where they would put the road to connect Yosemite with Mono Lake. He was back at the index in 1883. During this time, he turned the Homer Mining Index into a first class mining journal that was interesting to read with historical information about the Mono Basin. There are, there are items that he wrote about that he had discovered that probably aren't written down anywhere. Different things about Yosemite, the Mona Basin, um, just a wealth of information he wrote. The Homer Mining Index 
was suspended in November 1894 to a, due to a financial 1884, pardon me, due to a financial crisis that shut down the local mines, including the May Lundy. Lundy was almost deserted. A fire in 1886 destroyed almost all the buildings in the business area of Lower Lundy Canyon, those lower buildings that we saw in that first photo. In 18 88, the mining crisis was over and the mines in Lake Canyon were working. A new build, mill was built in Lake Canyon, the Jackson and Lakeview Mill. Start, starting in 1890, new buildings were built in the burned area and Lundy got new life. James E. Townsend started up the old Homer Mining Index in October 1888 and published his special style of news until October 1895. There is too much to tell about lying, Jim, in the short time I have tonight, but there are dozens of articles and a book written about him. George Montrose, a newspaper man who grew up in Bodie, wrote an article about him in 1952 that Jim was a talker, yarn spinner, practical joker, public liar, and a competence man. He was a typesetter by profession and was well known for his ability to compose articles while setting the type. <laughs> and he had a way with words. One of my favorites, Lundy Lovely between May and December. During these months, there is but a thin partition between it and heaven. Lying Jim died in 1900. Cause of death, final failure of a brave but weary liver, which has come to an overwhelming volume of frontier whiskey tossed at it over the years. <laughs> Next. This is Jesse Montrose Angst, the eldest daughter of Rodney Montrose. Tioga Lake was named Jesse Montrose Lake for a, a long time, shown on maps as Lake Jesse. Uh, when they renamed a lot of uh, sites in uh, Yosemite, it was uh, named Tioga. And Douglas Hubbard, one of the rangers in Yosemite, tried to get them to keep the name Lake Jesse. She came from Genoa, Nevada to Lundy in 1880 when she was 15 years old. She went, married William Angst, 18 years her senior, in 1882. They had one daughter, Arlie Caroline. William Angst was a graduate of Franklin, Kentucky University, and was a superintendent and later agent for the Great Consolidated, Great Sierra Consolidated Mining Company at Tioga. He was working at the Jackson and Lakeview Mill, where in 1890, he had a fatal, a tar, fatal heart attack at 49. Next. This is the home of William and Jesse. The house was one of the three houses located below the Hotel Monte facing Lundy Lake. They purchased this house from Richard Pierce, who lived in the house next to them on the north side. Both houses burned in 1910. Next. This is the interior of their home. So you can see she was a collector. Interesting, the items that are in there 
violin, musical instruments. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you more about Jesse. I've been researching Lundy for a long time, and I had been. And I had a feeling that there, somebody had a treasure trove of Lundy material. So a young woman came to Lundy to look for her great grandmother, who ended up being Jesse's, to um, find their home site. And her, somebody gave her my name, but she was moving to Kansas, but they, she left her phone number, so I called her. And she told me what she had, that Jesse had collected, evidently had a camera. The majority of these photos were, came from her collection. So she sent me um, copies, photocopies, and said any of the photos that I wanted, she would have copied and sent them to me, and she did. So she later came back and, to, and was living in Bridgeport and told me to come over and see what she had. Well, the, she had been told when her grandmother died, is there anything in the basement that you would like? And she says, oh, I would like to have grandma's uh, trunk. So she got the trunk and she had never opened it. She opened it and it is amazing. Dresses, clothing, jewelry. Uh, Jesse kept everything. And um, I, I mean, I was in awe that I would love for the museum to have it. It's just uh, out and calling cards from Lundy. They, they went, when they visited, they took calling cards in a mining camp. You know how they used to do? Oh my goodness. Anyway, it was just fantastic that she was this type. Scrapbooks. Um, it was articles from in, while well, she was in San Francisco, San Francisco about Lundy. Anything Lundy, she just loved. Who, Jessie? Oh, Arlie. Oh, she, yeah. She is a, um, she would probably come. She is a um, genealogist with the Mormon uh, genealogy uh, in, in uh, Salt Lake. Yeah, I haven't, I, we corresponded for a long time, but she lost her husband and I haven't, we haven't in a while ex except Jane exchanged Christmas cards. But she was the one who came to look for her grandmother's home site. But, um, and her husband, she, one more thing and then I'll move on. He had been a scribe, William had been a scribe on a sailing ship in, in the 1870s. And he was, and so she showed me his little journal. It was about that big, tiny, tiny letters. And in it, I opened it up, she let me open, see it, and it said Palestine, 1877. So, you know, people traveled even back then. Anyway, I feel blessed that I was able to to meet them and acquire all this information. Next. This is an early schoolhouse, Lundy schoolhouse. By January in 1881, the citizens of Lundy recognized the need for a school. A school census showed that there were 15 school-aged children. A school committee decided to erect a building for use as a school and a town hall. School and the school could be used by traveling performers, plays, for voting, visiting preachers could come, and, a, and they could hold a Sunday school. Lundy never had a church, never had a bank, so the school often filled in for those things that they needed. A fundraising play, Lend Me Five Shillings, was put on during this time to raise money for the school. 
The school opened in May 1881. There are two funds, state funds for paying teachers and a library fund for books, maps, and charts. Property taxes were used to um, get, get funds for the schools also. Schools were often closed due to illness, bad weather, or not having a teacher or enough students. School was often closed in the winter. 15 students were required to open a school with an average daily attendance eight to 10. School activities, a dancing school on Tuesday evenings, May Day activities, spelling matches, map drawing matches. All the people in Lundy were um, supportive of all these activities. The school was destroyed by an avalanche in 1891, not this one. Social dance to raise funds to rebuild school in a different location. Honor Roll was frequently published in the newspaper for attendance and scholastic achievement. Next. This is the last of the Lundy School. It is probably the same one as the previous one. It has just been altered. And it was located in a site that was um, out of an avalanche area. This is the one that you can see in most photos. You'll see it, it looks like it's ready to fall down. Number next. This restaurant was in Lundy from 1880 through the 19, well, 40s at least. Jim Toy, a Chinese, opened this restaurant in 1880. He also had a laundry. He was disgusted with the miners for not paying their debts and sold out and went to Bridgeport and had a restaurant there for many years. There was always an active Chinese population in Lundy, working as servants, cooks, in laundries, wood cutting, and work the streams placer mining. The index reported Asiatic school for scandal that meant a house of prostitution. There is a wonderful story about the kidnapping of Ling Loy, a Chinese prostitute, in Margaret Calhoun's book, Pioneers of Mono Basin. So if anyone who would like to know more about that, um, the kidnapping and held for ransom, uh, that's a great place to read it. There were different companies, Tongs, engaged in continuous warfare. How many of these people the, there were, we really don't know. Probably a dozen. In 1896, the Bridgeport newspaper reported a rampage in Lundy. A Chinese man murdered several Chinese men and women with an ax. Arrest took, arrested, taken to Bridgeport for a trial and found guilty. Killings took five minutes. The first, it was the first capital punishment case in Mono County since 1878. He was sent to San Quentin where he attempted to kill his cellmate, claiming, yelling, me crazy, me crazy. The first criminal in the state of California to be hung on a day other than Friday, which was referred to as Hangman's Day. A photo was published in the San Francisco, San Francisco Call. The paper reported a speedy 
justice, only 138 days from arrest to hanging. Next. In 1883, Priscilla Gable was operating a hotel and lodging house with a bar, the Oakland House at 4th and Main in Lundy. Mrs. Gable had put a notice in the index that she was the sole proprietor and that her husband, Fred, had no involvement in her business. For some reason, possibly to raise some money, she decided to raffle the hotel. This is a copy of the raffle ticket with 350 chances at $5 each, all complete and in running order on the evening of September 22nd, the drawing. The highest row takes the hotel and the lowest row takes a fine sewing machine and three fat hogs. On the day of the drawing, there was speculation that Fred would win. But no, on the day of the drawing, Priscilla drew the winning ticket. Oddly, there was no complaint. Could be she was owed money. So I'm going to tell you how I found this ticket. I had just read this story in the index and I was in the museum and I was looking at the photo board we have that, that swinging one. And I looked on this one page, Lundy, and down at the bottom, I looked and there was a little, this ticket. And I got on my knees, I says, no, it can't be. So I had Norman get in there and take the ticket out and it was. So I, he let me take it and make some copies and then I gave it back and it's back in the case. So if you wanna go and see it yourself, it's there. But the amazing part that it survived all that time. The various mercantile businesses advertise groceries, boots, shoes, glassware, hardware, tools, miners' clothing, and prospector supplies. As freight train, freight wagons and teams made regular trips to Carson City, Lundy residents were well supplied with all the goods they needed. Peddlers from the Central Valley made regular trips with fresh fruit and vegetables, and potatoes were brought from Mono Lake farmers. Pioneer Cash Store, owned by Rosenwald and Kahn, that was located in Upper Canyon, were from Plymouth and was a subsidiary of Ruse Brothers, which became a well-known establishment on the west side of the mountains and became a large uh, store, grocery store chain. Gave notice in the Homer Mining in the end, the Rosenwald and Kahn gave notice in the Homer Mining Index that goods would be sold for cash only. They want coin. Chin music is not collateral. They have enough in fiddling. If you want good, cheap goods, come down with the dust. Give us, this gives us some examples of mining camp slang. Chin music. The Central Meat Market was in Lundy. Cattle brought from the Honeywell Ranch in Bridgeport and processed on the North Shore of Lundy Lake. Rendering pots were still there in the 1940s. Area referred to still as Slaughterhouse Cove. Next. Next. In 1880, Wells Fargo, that's the building there, opened for business with passenger coaches running twice 
a day to Bodie. H.N.H. Brown was the agent. After leaving Lundy in 1884, he became very well known as an agent for Wells Fargo. He's mentioned in a book, Treasury Express, Epic Days of Wells Fargo. The Lundy Assay Office was located in the Wells Fargo building. An ad in the Homer Mining Index said, gold dust and bullion bought, ores and mining tests made. The building became a mercantile store in the 1890s, operated by A.A. A. Travis. It became the Rosenwald and Kahn store in 1903. This is how the students stored their skis outside the school. This is the schoolhouse on the left. And uh, I find that very, very interesting. Next. These are two young ladies on skis or snowshoes, as they were called at the time. Most of the skis in Lundy were made by Louis de Chambeau. You can't see the tips of those to be sure. They cost $5 a pair. A pole was $1. They only used one pole. Miners' wages at the time were four to five dollars a day. So a pair of skis cost a day's wages. Skiing was a popular activity in Lundy, also the best way to get around in the winter with snow and ice. And it could be dangerous. Miss, this was a little blurb in the Homer Mining Index. Miss Ada Cook, age 15, and Eddie Kelly, age 13, are the champion snowshoe runners of this section. Each of them, a few days since, having made the run from a point above the upper line of Lakes Canyon Toll Road, down the side of Mount Gilcrest, on an angle of 45 degrees to Mill Creek a distance of 2,000 feet in 24 seconds. And Eddie turned around and did it again. Next. What's that? <laughs> So this is down on the lake. This is the brewery on the left. That other little building is the powder magazine. Of course, there was a need for a powder magazine with all the explosives that were there. It was built of stone, and they determined that it was the best place to have it was down on the lake. They're ice skate. There's some people ice skating. You see the, the skis are still there. And there's two little, two children on, a, on sleds. I find it fascinating that the women skated and skied in those long dresses. John Becker, a German immigrant, came to Lundy in 1881 from Mammoth, where he had a brewery. He located a site on the north shore of the lake and moved his equipment from Mammoth. He located a spring on the lake in the vicinity of the brewery. When the lake is low, as it was a couple of years ago, you can, the spring is still there and bubbles up out of the ground. Most of the time it is under the water of the lake. John Becker and was active in Lundy affairs, often serving on boards and committees. John and his wife lived in Lundy for 20 years and moved to San Francisco in 1902.
Next. At the turn of the century, what? Oh. Sorry about that. Some Yosemite travelers in front of the Butterfield store and post office. In 1882, Archie Leonard, later a park ranger, started a saddle train between Lundy and Yosemite. They went up the trail from Lake Canyon to Bennettville with ads for Valley, the Valley's Bernard's Hotel in the index. These tourist saddle trains operated off and on in the summer until 1906, with travelers from Reno, Virginia City, Mammoth, and the Mono Basin. Trip in two days with an overnight stay at Lake Tanaya. A group of young women and a couple of young men came all the way from Yarrington to do this saddle train. They, um, it was written up in the newspaper over in Yarrington. Next. At the turn of the century, tennis became very popular. And of course, Lundy had to have a court. A men's league and a women's league were formed. A blurb in the Bridgeport newspaper reported, if the men come home from work and there is no supper on the table, you will find your wife at the tennis court. <laughs> they didn't play bridge, they played tennis. Next. First thing I want to point out on this photograph is there's the three little houses that face the lake. That's Jesse's in the middle, Pierce's on the right, and A.A. A. Travis lived in the, the one on the left. He, the two burned, but his did not, so he remained living there. Numerous boats were built for the brewery. Two were named the Comet and the Mono. As I've said before, the resi residents of Lundy recognized the value of the lake for recreation. Boat races were held. The brewery offered boats to its patrons. When brook trout were transplanted from Lake Tanaya, fishing was a popular sport. And most stores advertised fishing tackle. Some 1880, H Homer Mining Index excerpts. Trolling on the lake, a favorite amusement. Race on the lake between the Little Nell and the Maud Muller. Five boats on the lake, three with sails. Boat launched, the Maud Muller, a double ender, 16 feet, four inches long. Boat races on Lundy Lake. Lake, one of the finest boating places in the world. Races across the lake and back, two miles in 12 and a half minutes. Of course, these are all rowboats. It is very annoying for a man to go out fishing with a fancy rod, silk line, a fly hook, and all the paraphernalia of a fashionable sportsman without getting a bite. And coming across some fellow with a piece of bail rope fastened to a shark, shark hook and yanking out trout every minute or two. Compliments of Lying Jim, that comment. Meal tailings may jeopardize, jeopardize trout in the lake. They recognize that. J.M. Miller stocked Lake Oneida with trout. Lake Oneida is up in Lake Canyon. He would put cans on the side of horses and take them up. 
It is against the law to catch fish between November 3rd and April 1st. 15 to 20 pounds of trout can be caught per day. Thomas Price is the champion fisherman of the West. In one hour, he caught 103 trout trolling. So evidently those fish that were planted from Lake Tenaya really survived. It was a notice in 1881 that the fish in Lundy Lake were a cross between lake and brook trout. 19, in 1911, J.S. King and the Pacific Power Company requested trout, trout plants for Mill Creek, Rainbow, Eastern Brook, and Loch Leven. In 1911 later, the trout were planted in Mill Creek by the Power Company. Power Company frequently stocked the lakes and streams with the lake and streams with uh, trout. Marketing. Eighteen. I'm next. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is a Fourth of July celebration in 1900. On the left is the Butterfield store and post office. Across the street to the left to right is a hotel and saloon, the Hotel Monte, the Lakeview Hall. The Lakeview Hall was a, not a hotel. Everybody thinks when they see it in photos that it was a hotel. It was not, it was a dance hall. It, the floors were built on, it was built specifically for dancing. The floor was built on car strings so they would move up and down and there was dancing. And Lundy became very popular for its dances. People would come from Mono Lake and as far as Farrington's, south of Levining to dance. Al Rule played the fiddle Young girls would arrive and everybody would bring their dresses and they'd change into their dresses about six o'clock and dancing would start. The children were brought to and if they needed to, they made some pallets on the floor for them. And they kept dancing and at midnight, they would go over to the hotel for a midnight supper then come back and keep dancing until daylight so they could get home to do chores. The butcher shop in the middle, no, Nick Ward saloon first and the butcher shop next. I'm not sure which one of those. You already did? Okay. I don't know which one of those, you can see them there also. Um, were taken apart and moved to uh, Hammonds, which is now Tioga Lodge. So one of those two buildings came from Lundy. That happened frequently. Some of the buildings moved back and forth from town to town, from Lundy to Bodie, from Bodie to Lundy, and all because of lumber. Okay. This is an 1890s photo of Lundy. So the buildings on the right are the Butterfield store and his home up the canyon. And the building on the right there is the livery stable. I will, there are two buildings left in Lundy from the original. I will not mention those. The hotel, by this time the Taylor House, the Lakeview Hall, and as I said, the Nick Ward Saloon and the livery. And behind those is the Gorilla Mill. It was built by a uh, man from Bodie named Hot Boss. 
and is often referred to as as the tot boss meal. And on a lot of um, maps, it is shown as the tot boss meal. And so when they would have different questions on the property, they would always talk about it, but they would always ex exclude the tot boss meal. And not very many people even know that it was also the gorilla. And it was, had a water wheel, and the race is still there where the water came and turned it. It's down in the woods. And it was um, also operated a, a rostra. And many of the rostra rocks are still down there. And um, you have to kind of look for them, but they're all smooth from, from use. Then there is the, the um, Gem Toys restaurant. The building behind that is J.S. Pierce's cyanide plant. In the 1890s, he decided to try to use cyanide, cyanide to recover the tailings from the old, or the dumps from the old May Lundy that was located up Canyon. But it was, they were filled with sawdust because they were right next to um, Lundy's sawmill. So that was a waste. So there's that huge building. The foundations are still there. And, um, and it only lasts, they didn't even use it. And then the next building is, with the flagpole in front of it, is the only remaining one of the remaining buildings and with a flagpole in front of it. Between it and this side of the Jim Toy restaurant and down in off the road is a boarded over log cabin. And it was built in 1879 and it is still there. Nobody can tell it's a log cabin. It was built as a two room log cabin and has additional um, add-ons. It's privately owned now, so it is still standing. The other building belongs to the Hanna family, who Tom Hanna was married to John Muir's um, daughter, Wanda, and they came in the 20s and stayed, so they still own that building. I want to talk about the flagpole. We've seen it. It was even in that first photograph of the Lundy, old Lundy town site. And the reason the flagpole was there was there was a huge tree in the middle of the road at the intersection. And they cut it down, left the stump, and put a hole in it, drilled a hole, and that was where they put the flag. And it became well known, the Lundy flag. I've never seen the flag on it, a photograph, but it was there. So, In 1894, a miner, that same Tom Price that caught all those 103 fish, decided that the unsightly and rotting stump should be removed. So he used dynamite and removed it. Whether they still put the flag up into something else, I don't know. But it was there for many, many years. Next. This is the power plant in Lundy Canyon that was built by the Crystal Lake Mining Company in the late 1890s to generate power for the company's Lake Canyon mill. The power line going up the canyon, you can see it. So the power was generated in Lundy and the power line went up to the mill on Crystal Lake. Some of those poles are still there laying down. You'll see them um, if, you, if you hike up that way. That was a main road up way to get up to uh, Lake Canyon in the early days. There is a mule trail that goes switchbacks back and forth. If the uh, snow is just right, you can see it. We didn't know that. And that's the way we used to go up to Lake Canyon, my husband and I. 
the only power to Lundy from this camp, this plant, went to the mining office in Lundy. The town was not electrified. The power plant, this power plant was destroyed in that same 1911 avalanche here that this avalanche down at Jordan had. And the uh, operator of it was also killed. And he is buried in the cemetery with the others. Next. Okay, guys, we're almost done. This is Bert Taylor, who was born in Lundy, the first white child, in a 1904 Rio. He became a dealer for the Rio automobile in Reno. And he always loved Lundy. He came, I, I didn't get this meeting, but he came in 1975 or so and to visit, and I wish that I had got to meet him. I've been to Quincy and Blairston where he ended up moving. He had a big mining interest in that area that he ended up giving to the state for Plumas State Park. He also wrote a book about Lundy that is all in rhyme. This is not a real thick book, but it is amazing that he was able to do that. It's very interesting. By 1914, Lundy was almost totally abandoned. The post office was suspended and the school was abolished with the equipment of, of both to go to Mono Lake. Miners continued to do, come, to, come summers to do their annual proof of labor in order to hold their claims. In 1927, Frenchie D. Marsh, Marsh, a house painter from Tonopah, Nevada, bought some Lundy lots. He built a bait shop on the hotel lot. You can still see probably what is that foundation where the store in Lundy is. He put three boats on the lake for rent and rented out some old cabins to the fishermen who had started to come to the Eastern Sierra and began the next chapter of Lundy's history as a rustic fishing resort. I'd like to close by reading a poem Margaret Calhoun wrote, who wrote the pioneers of the Mono Basin. That's the last slide. I just wanted to point out one more thing. Look at how the buildings still look in 1904. They look in pretty good shape. So 10 years later, they're pretty bad. So I, just, I find that in. The other thing is there are no people. That is not unusual. A lot of old photographs of mining camps, that for some reason, they didn't show people so that's not very un un that's not very unusual <laughs> okay this is margaret's poem lundy dear old lundy can you hear me calling just an old timer with memories of the past memories of your winters with the snowflakes falling warm sunny days which hurried by so fast all of the golden colors in autumn times round you in your lovely canyons, how they gleam and glow. I'm so glad you had a girl, May Lundy, found you a beautiful place in the long ago. Do you sometimes listen for the sound of voices when your minds were rich in silver and gold? Then one day folks went away and left you and much of your history 
will always hold. Yes, the living town of Lundy will not be forgotten as long as there are people with hearts and pens and descendants looking for great grandma's home and members of the Mono Basin Historical Society who are dedicated to preserving and protecting what remains of Mono Basin history. <laughs> Any questions? North of Levining at the end of the lake. What year? That was someone we talked about. The first one? Second. Oh, yeah, the second photo. Yeah. It was 1880. See, what was what was the name of the book that you mentioned that was a, a pictorial called pictorial history poetic history by bert lundy yeah what was the name of that book um i can't remember, I can't remember. i'm sorry exactly um i should find it pardon i have I I have a copy of it. Um, oh, I wish I could remember. I think it might be just Lundy. If you look up uh, Lundy by Bert, Albert uh, Lundy, you, it should show. Okay, thank you. Yeah, why don't you? That could... This mic on and Bring the questions, the chat back to my computer. Let's see. Uh, from Steve, Steve Moore, staging to Bodhi twice a day, question mark. Is the access to the outside world through Bodhi, i.e. onto Aurora and Hawthorne, or was there another route that served that purpose? It was between Lundy and Bodhi. And then they went from Bodhi to Hawthorne for connections on the railroad and would go clear to Mount House, Carson City, and over to San Francisco. Many of the people left in the winter and went to San Francisco area. And it was as often as twice a day? At, at first, yes, when the Wells Fargo stage was. Now, there was also stages from Bodie to Lundy, and they did not come twice a day. Uh, Constant Miller. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation, Linda. I especially love the stories about Jesse. My question is, do you know how the natural Lake Lundy compares area and or extent to the current reservoir? In your photos, they seem very similar, i.e. the dam didn't raise the natural lake level much, question mark. I have no idea what that picture of in 1880, it looks large, nice. but it may have went down. They did drain, uh, not drain, but use Lundy Lake water. They built a small dam the farmers did, ranchers, because they were did use uh, water from Lundy Lake to for their irrigation. So it may have been up and down. Okay. And of so, course, it depends on the snow. So um, not a lot of questions, but a lot of accolades here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. So. Linda, were a lot of those pictures from this treasure trove? Yes, they all were. Also, also, most of the information, as you realize, came from the Homer Mining Index. Fortunately, I was given a microfilm of the early one, and then I have some photocopies of the later years I got. They're 1895. So, I mean, I've been fortunate. People have been very generous in helping me a lot. So. 
Yes, yes, yes. I, I mean, she may never be prepared to give. You know, I was. What she gave me was copies, but I mean, it. There's articles in in San Francisco about Lundy, and she collected those about fishing. It's a, and a lot of photos that I didn't use in this. Oh yeah, I will. I will call her. Yeah, she's. She's, I don't even know, I'm not even sure she's still in, in Utah, but I hope so. That's supposed to be, oh, the picture of the inside of the house, was that um, Jesse's grandmother's house? No, that was Jesse's house. Oh, Jesse's house. She was, a, she was this um, Carolyn Andrews, great uh, grandmother. Jesse was, and, and the family, Jesse's uh, angst, her husband uh, William died. Then she moved back, she and Arlie went to Bodie, and then she married a childhood friend from Genoa, and they ended up in San Francisco. That's how that happened. And he was a blind, he was blind, their second husband, and he operated a newsstand in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And the the um, the violin and the trumpet hanging up on the wall. That was the picture I was talking about. Yes. Did you get any, any information about the, those At instruments? At the dances, um, various Lundy uh, residents played at the, for the dances. Al Rule, which we are familiar with, he played the. the fiddle the violin at the dances mm -hmm. there was a um one of the montroses played so there were different people and i don't i haven't read that jesse or william played but somebody was evidently did mm -hmm. yeah great okay here's some Any final words uh master of ceremonies nope oh. okay Okay, thank you very much. All. <laughs>